Okay, beloveds, let's turn in our Bibles to the second chapter of Hebrews. You know, I actually am quite concerned because I realize I am flying through this book faster than I have ever gone through any other exposition of Scripture because it comes in blocks. It's not a case that I can just do it in one verse at a time, though, you know, it's very easy sometimes to get stuck in a verse. But when to really understand what's being said here, you're dealing with blocks and working through those. And uh, today we'll be reading from verse 9 down to the end of the chapter. I may be dealing with verses 10 to 18 and finishing chapter 2. Unbelievable. But it it is what it is. Okay, let me read it to you. Beginning in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, that is Jesus, by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom all are, for whom are all things And by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering, through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them his brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of this assembly. I will sing praises to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch uh, then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation For the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to aid those who are being tempted. Amen. Now the idea behind the book of Hebrews. A letter to Hebrews. The sermonette. I don't know what you call it. The exhortation to the Hebrews. Is that our faith in Jesus might be strengthened, built up, that we might become more secure, confident, straightforward, bold, that we might not waver in our faith. We remember the three peoples that he's speaking to, those to whom their letter is written, those to whom he speaks to, that is the believers, those who are steadfast in their faith. And going through perhaps persecution, trials, stresses, sufferings. And then he's writing to the closet believers. The, the people who are on the, in, 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 the, in the line. The, 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 the ones who are sitting on the fence. They, 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 they like the idea of being believers. They recognize that Jesus, yeah, he was special. A, a, a prophet, perhaps the Messiah but yet have not been able to or are unwilling to go, whole, to go the whole way. They are those whom said they believed in Jesus, but because of their fear of the Pharisees, they weren't followers because they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. These are the ones who don't really want to pay the cost. They enjoy the benefits. They enjoy the fellowship. They recognize that... The, you know, There is blessing in Jesus, but they're reluctant to go the whole way for fear of ridicule, persecution, rejection, excommunication. And then also, finally, he's writing to the unbelieving, the unbelieving Jews, those who reject Jesus, who, in their mind, he's an abomination. And they can't come to grips. 
How can the Messiah come and be this worthless peasant, be rejected of his nation, and die? And that was the real problem for the Jews. The Messiah wasn't supposed to die. He's supposed to come and make a kingdom, deliver us from our enemies, to bring about peace. And this great empire. And when they looked at Jesus, they couldn't come to grips. He died. Is Messiah to die? What was the worth in that? What was the purpose? And, in, and to die on the cross? That's embarrassing. That's humiliating. How can the king of glory, he who is honored above all others... The Lord of Lords and the Kings of Kings, the King of Kings, how could he have been placed upon a cross? So we all understand. We know because we're Christianized. We're so Christianized that we, we recognize, we understand that the, the crucifixion was the worst kind of death. If you really wanted someone to suffer, if you really wanted to humiliate someone, if you really wanted to show your disdain and hatred for them, you crucified them. You made an open show of them. You displayed before all the world your naked disdain for that individual. See, the Romans didn't consider death as a punishment. In the ancient world, when you committed a terrible crime, the worst punishment that they could give you wasn't death. We consider death as the worst punishment, you know? when you put an injection somewhere, or you electrocute them, or you shoot them, and they die, and then that's all over. In the Middle East, and indeed in Ireland, haha, we don't consider death the worst punishment. Pain and suffering is the worst punishment. Why would you want them to die? Still it ends. If you want to punish someone, you suffer them. I have a book, and please don't think lesser of me, I have a book that considers all of the... Uh, the ways that people were uh, killed in the past or punished, you know, in the, in the past. And the Assyrians had this wonderful way where they, they put a man on a boat and they covered him in honey. I don't know if you know this one. And they put a weight upon his chest and they just floated the boat out under, out under the, the, the marsh, the river. And all the bugs, all the flies, all the blood-sucking things would come. And the man was trapped under the weight upon this raft. He couldn't move his arms, his legs. But the bugs could get in. And the bugs would come and they would nest in his ear. You know yourself when you're in the forest, the flies, you pick them berries and the flies go in your ear. Get out of my ear. Drives you mad. The mosquitoes are always biting you. Well, the Syrians, they would... Death could take like three, four weeks. As this person is floating around, and their wails and their screams, and every time they breathe, the, the weight would press down on their chest, and they would always be struggling for breath, and the sun would be beating down upon them, and the, the elements. And the idea was they would suffer. And so for the Jews, the fact that the Messiah, the Anointed One, the One sent by God, the Prophet, He who was to come into the world to rescue His people. The idea of Him suffering in such a way as this was distasteful. It was shocking. It was impossible to their minds. And they couldn't reconcile Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection couldn't. Why? And so the writer of the Hebrews is demonstrating to them. He's, he's turning their world upside down. He's telling them that the death that Christ died wasn't a humiliating death. It wasn't a, a shameful death. It wasn't a horrible death. It was glorious and great. Christ came to die. Here in this portion of scripture, we have been told that Christ's destiny, his destiny, the reason he came into this world was to die. The author here, the writer here is 
speaking directly to the Jewish mind, and not just to the Jewish mind, to all of us as believers, helping us to understand that this wasn't some accident or some betrayal or some, in the sense of, you know, that Jesus didn't have any power over it. But it was all part of the plan. It was all part of the purpose. There, oh, fat name. What's that name like someone? Uh, understanding? Understanding of the, of the Messiah was wrong. It was limited. They were seeing the backside of it. The after resurrection and the kingdom that is to come. In verse 10 here. It tells us that for it was fitting for him whom all things and by all by whom all things were made and bringing many sons to her to make perfect or to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. He is demonstrating to them or explaining to them that this is all part of the plan. The word captain in my Bible says captain, maybe in some of yours it says author or founder. Uh, the word in the, in the Greek means pioneer. Vegledere, I think in Swedish. The one who goes before and makes a pathway. The one who sent out to lead us on the journey. Think of Moses leading the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. Jesus is the one who went and made a way where there was no way. And by doing so, fulfilled God's purposes and plans. Now, the idea of being made perfect through sufferings it isn't that his perfection in some way was incomplete. Don't think that Jesus was made more perfect through suffering. When Jesus was born as a child, he was 100% a child, as a baby. He was 100% God, 100% perfect in his nature, sinless, not needing per, to be made better in any way. The idea is that in his humanity, he completed all of the things that was required of a human being. He lived a perfect life. He completed Made an end. Remember Jesus said, do not think I have come to destroy the law, but to complete it. To perfect it. To finish it. And through his sufferings, the, the life that he lived, the obedience that he walked in, and indeed finally the death that he died, he was obedient in all things until the very end. Remember, we see him in the garden, that fantastic picture where he's praying and interceding, and giving supplication, and he's sweating great drops of blood. I mean, what do he pray? He doesn't pray, Lord, you know, do what I want you to do. Lord, please make this happen. We see the perfect picture of submission and surrender. Lord, Father, not my will but your will be done. Even in the last great battle of his life, we see this perfect picture of submission. And, uh, but why? Not just that he was a super nice guy. Oh, Jesus, really nice guy. You know, every mother's dream of a husband for their child or... Why can't you be like more of Jesus for their sake? You know, that kind of conversation. It's more than that. Jesus was born with a destiny, with a purpose, with a fate. And it wasn't simply just to die for his own sins because he had none. Jesus didn't die because of his own sins. He died because of the sins of others. The idea is... He went into death. He went through death. He pioneered the way through death in order that he might bring people with him. Think of the resurrection. He was made alive again as to demonstrate the life that is to come to make a way where there was no way. Verse 11 
We are seeing the fulfillment of Christ's destiny and also the destiny for his followers. That which was to happen to them. So Christ came in order to bring many sons and daughters to glory. In verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For this reason, he was not ashamed to call them his brethren, them brethren. Again, he's demonstrating that in order that there might be a, a, a unity, a togetherness, that we might identify with him and he might identify with us, Jesus had to live the life, had to go through the things, had to suffer as we suffer in this life. He's drawing a, a, a dent, a identification, a similarity. He was just like us. Remember, they're struggling with the picture of how can Jesus be truly the Messiah? How can Jesus truly be God? God can't die. What was the point? Have you ever considered it? Ever thought of it? I have to be honest, I had never considered it. I'd never thought of it. I just, I'm so Christianized. Even growing up as an unbeliever, I was so Christianized that I understood Jesus died for our sins. You know, basic Sunday school stuff. But why did Jesus have to die? How could Jesus die? What, what has that got to do with me? He died. What's it got to do with me? 2,000 years ago. I remember when I was a child. Amos' age, perhaps 15. Or really Amos' age, I can't remember. What age is Amos? Even worse, 13. And I remember being cheeky and up to one of my religious teachers. The teacher who taught the religious class. I said, what's it got to do with me what some man 2,000 years ago did? This man, Jesus, that you're teaching us about. I have no relevant relationship to him or to his, this history why do i need to learn of re the religious history of the jews why are you not teaching me about the religious history of my own people the, the pagan irish uh, you know they used to kill each other and chop each other's heads off you know put them on poles such uplifting and and i again i remember then asking but as becoming a believer i'd never really considered what what relevance is the death of Jesus to us? Why? Why is it important that he lived and he died? And the answer here again is that he suffered that he might draw a comparison to ours, that he might be supply his own sufferings. And the idea of suffering or, or sanctification, to be made holy or to be set apart, he who was set apart and sets others apart. That we're all one. That should delight us. Uh, when I was considering that and thinking about that today, I was thinking, wow. Uh, that we're not just simply an add-on or uh, some sort of supplement. We're not an afterthought or a parenthesis. But that in Christ we are one together with him. He is the captain of our faith. Um, that when God looks upon us, and I know I've said this before, when God looks upon us, he doesn't see Daniel or Martin or Joe or, or Fred or Kyle or any of the others here or here, here. He sees Christ. He identifies us with Christ that he sees and recognizes you as an individual, of course. But in the merit of the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood that washes you clean from sin. It is his righteousness that is deposited upon you, into you, into your account in heaven. And he calls us brethren, family members. Jesus doesn't think of you as a foreigner. Jesus doesn't think of you as a, a stranger or even just a friend or a... a Someone that he knows an acquaintance, but rather he names you brother. He names you sister. Family member. Blood. There is a connection there that will not, cannot be broken. 
And it's not because of how you feel or what you've done. It's not because of you, you said yes to Jesus or something like this, some silliness. Put up your hand in a meeting. It is because of what Jesus has done. He paid the price. He lived the life. He died the death. He was resurrected as a statement, a, a confirmation of debts paid. And now in him we see the fullness. Why did Jesus die? Why did he have to come as a man? In order that you and I might know that we are accepted as family. He goes on here, quoting from the scriptures. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of, a, of the assembly, I will sing to you. Here, the writer is quoting from Psalm 22. Verse 22 of Psalm 22 which we all know is a, is a messianic psalm. Even in Christ's day, it was recognized as a messianic psalm. Jesus quotes from this psalm, or maybe this psalm is quoting Jesus. Um, when he's on the cross. Indeed, the first time I met Daniel, or was aware of Daniel, Daniel had quoted this psalm on the internet. Oh, wretched man that I am. I can't remember what it was, but I remember thinking, what is that? And it was through Daniel's website, Musk, and I think it was, that I actually became acquainted with this many, many, many years ago. But here at this point in Psalm 22, after the whole of Psalm is talking about the, the, the suffering of the servant of God, the hardship, the difficulties, the bewailing of the one who is suffering, at verse 22, there is a shift, there is a transformation, there is a, a change in tempo. It goes from a bewailing and a crying out to a triumph. And here in this psalm, which was readily recognized as a messianic psalm, we're seeing, he's reminding, yes, the Messiah had to suffer, but then there came a point of triumph. And here, he's saying again, there is a connection between the Christ and the people. There will be a, a he won't be way up there and we're way down here. He's one of us. There is a connection. He's a person just like we are. See, the Jews had formed this picture of the Messiah as almost a superhuman being. The Superman coming down. There were myths and fables around at that time that it would be an angel. That it would be some sort of mythic hero from the time of heroes who would come, you know, untouchable. Like Achilles, you know, who had been dipped in the blood or whatever, you know, it's all untouchable. You can't break it and can't touch it, except for that little spot in his heel. Where his mom dipped them in the blood. Or the river sticks, sorry. And so the writer here is combating all of those myths and fables. And showing the Jews that he was to be one of us. Different, and divine, and greater. But in the same sense, we're, we're seeing a, the two natures being revealed. Yes, he is the son. But yes, he was made a little lower than the angels for a time. And here, quoting from the scriptures, once again showing that we are brethren. We are together with him. He is one of us. Humanity. I like where it says here, in, uh, in the midst of the assembly, in the Greek, it's the, the word for congregation, ecclesia, where one where we we traditionally get the word church from, for the called out ones, those who are summoned. There is this idea of after the suffering, there is the joy of recognition, of connection, of family, of brethren. And again, it says, I will put my trust in him. And that's the Messiah talking. I will put my trust in him. I think it's from uh, Isaiah 8. I think it is 17. If I come out of it off the top of my head. 
It's the, the idea of the Messiah saying, I am just like you. I am trusting in God. As we must trust and live by faith, so the Messiah trusted and lived by faith. And we saw that, didn't we, when we looked at the Gospel of Luke, one of the details, one of the, the main functions of that letter, you know, that epistle, not epistle, gospel, is to demonstrate Christ's life of faith, his teachings on prayer, his, the acts, the miracles, the wonders that he performs, all acts of faith he, he is depending upon the Father. And again in verse 13, here am I and the children whom God has given me. So we see here again the idea that Christ did not come just simply for himself, but rather that there would be a people. There would be a following. Remember it called him a pioneer, the one who leads the way, the one who opens up the frontier, who makes a way through danger. We're being instructed here that those little ones, remember when Jesus calls his followers, these little ones whom you have given me, Father, he prays for them. That in a figurative way, I know we don't think of ourselves as being so, we're like the children of Christ. I, I think of Jesus as a brother. I think of him as my Lord. I have to be honest, rarely think of him as my dad. You know? I think of God the Father as my father, Jesus as my brother, my God. But here in some sense, we're, we're being told that we are little ones being entrusted into the care of Jesus. That in some way, in some high, we are the family. And he's pressing that really hard, pressing that the point that we are brethren together in Christ and indeed this is the reason why the Messiah had to die in order that he might bring many sons and daughters to glory didn't die for his own sins didn't have any didn't die because some unfortunate circumstance it was part of the plan in order that you and I and the Jews of their day and all the people who have believed in Christ since this time throughout the ages may be part of the family. This is what it cost to create the family of God. In verse 14, he clarifies, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, or blood and flesh, as it says in the Greek, he himself likewise shared in the same. And here we, we're, we're, we're told the two reasons why Jesus Christ had to die. He makes a, a sum up of that thing, um, whatever that is in English. That he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. That's the first one. And the second one, and release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage under slavery. Jesus came to die. Remember the Jews are asking, why did the Messiah have to die? And so the writer, quite clearly, plain speaking, the best kind of speaking there is, isn't it? I'm a very plain speaking man. That he might destroy the power of death. Oh, death, where is thou sting? Oh, I stepped into Old English there. That's Frederick's fault. This King James Bible. Jesus came to destroy the power of death. Isn't it ironic that Jesus destroyed the power of death by dying? That death has no hold upon him? It says here, the power of death, that is the devil. Him who had the power of death, that is the devil. However that looks. He's, I, I like the fact that the writer here isn't engaging in theological discussions. He's telling you that Jesus 
through his death, destroyed the power of the devil. The power of death. Not just simply that when we die, but all those corrupting influences. Think of the world when Jesus was walking in it. How dark the world was. This happening... The Jews were but a pinprick on the surface of the globe. How many people in Jesus' time knew his story, had heard his name, or even knew about the Jews? Minuscule. But in the, since the, in the 2,000 years since then, the name of Jesus Christ has stretched around the globe. That light, that sanctifying influence, that mortifying, killing of the flesh, the world, and the devil. Now, I'm not post melt we all know it, but I do believe in the kingdom of Christ and the influence of it. The, the mighty tree that shall grow and fill the whole earth with his influence. Jesus Christ came to put an end to the works of the devil. And yet, though we live in a world that is still ruled in some sense, by the enemy, governed. And by that I mean he is an influencing force in this world, moving in politics, moving in the, not necessarily the devil personally, but moving in the affairs of man, causing division and schism and tempting people and infirming people. We see from the Bible examples of women who are, were bound by the devil, not a the devil, but a devil. People who were filled with unclean spirits and needed to be released. We see that their influence was real and manifest and intimate and personal. Yet the Bible says that Jesus Christ came to deliver people from that. And we live today in a world that's full of light and healthy influence. Our laws, the laws of our country, are based upon the teachings of Jesus Christ. Old Testament, New Testament, you said, well, Kyle, they're Old Testament laws. It's the word of Jesus Christ, whether it's Genesis or Revelation, it's all his word. Our cultural dealings, our cultural laws, because there is the law of the land and then there's the law of how we communicate to one another. We don't lie. Lying is not against the law, just in case you all know that, but it's wrong. Adultery is not against the law, but it's wrong. At least I don't think adultery is wrong, against the law. Enough people do it, so if it is, then everybody's in trouble. But it's wrong. And so when we, we govern ourselves and our social interactions by the law of God, the influence of Christ so seeping into our cultures that we understand we know what's right and what's wrong and of course the people of this world who do not know christ cannot obey that and are definitely still under the bondage of the enemy but we see very clearly that christ's influence in this world caused a social revolution caused a cultural revolution caused a global revolution and cast out all the pagan religions for the most part and set about a good, honest, cleansing environment. The influence of Christ's death was to break the power of Satan. And I think we in our lives, we should rejoice in this. What, what do we have to be afraid of Satan for? And I'm not encouraging you to go all around and say, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Whatever. I don't know why people say that in an American voice, but they do. You know, uh, or have it, it, discussions with the devil or go looking for people who are possessed or whatever else. Please don't be so foolish. But when we are facing situations in our life, difficulties, whatever else, we need not be afraid. We need not have to even worry about the influence of the devil for we just declare and, and, and rest in our faith in Christ 
we understand that come what it may, we are safe. Safe in this life and safe in this. Now they may come, they may arrest us, they may put us in jail. They may chop our heads off or whatever else for our faith. But that doesn't remove the security that we have in Christ. We are simply adding to his glory. As the Jews in, his, in this day were suffering under the, the yoke of Rome. He's telling them as, as Christ suffered. Oh, they'll get to that bit in, a, in a bit. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Skipping points in my message there. Oh my goodness. Get back in line. So we understand that Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil that are the power of death, that is the works of the devil, that he did. And by doing so, he was able to set us free because it says in the second, and release those who through fear of death were, so, <laughs> were all their lifetime subject to bondage. One of the great things I love about being a believer is I am not afraid to die. When the Lord saved me, there was a transformation and a change in me. And a fearlessness was erupted. You know, it, it burst forth. I remember, I've told you this before, I know I repeat myself, and you're like, oh God. When I was doing outreach as a young man on a Roman Catholic estate owned by the IRA, and we had a big Jesus bus, a bus with Jesus written on the side of it, and I was there with some American girls, and um, the rest of the team was doing evangelism by some school somewhere else, and uh, we saw this crowd of young people and children coming up the road, and we thought, oh, this would be a wonderful opportunity. So we were all, I was on the bus with these two girls, and we went outside, and as we... As we went outside, these three men in full army regalia with balaclavas and their IRA stuff, holding weapons. I can't remember what weapons. I remember one was a shotgun, one was a rifle, one perhaps was a Kalashnikov. I can't really remember. It was so long ago and I'm so old. And I didn't really focus on the guns. I was focused on the men. And... And the, the poor American girls, like, they panicked so much. They ran into the bus and lay on the floor of the bus thinking that we were going to get killed. And, and the IRA men came up marching up the street and they, they stood and they demanded that we Protestants leave their area, blah, blah. We'd been there a couple of days and they were had enough of us. And, uh, and they wanted us to leave. And, uh, but instead of being frightened, I was angry. And I, I thought, this is a great opportunity for evangelism. And as... And we had this like little stage outside the bus. And I remember standing on the, st the, on the stage, preaching at them, saying to them, look into my eyes, see in my eyes, I'm not afraid to die. Put the gun there and shoot me. As foolish that I was. Put the gun there and shoot me, you'll see. The next moment I'm off to heaven. But if I put the gun to your head, where would you be? Where would you be? And the flick went, and they didn't really know what to do. <laughs> they were like, whoa, 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 he's not running away. And all the kids, all the kids went quiet. You know, I can't even tell you how many it was, but there was, in my memory, there was, there was a great crowd of children, estate children, the worst kind of children there are. And um, they all went quiet. And the men didn't really know what to do because they were expecting us to like be like the American girls to hide on the floor of the bus and they were having all the glory of chasing us away. Great story to tell. And so they, they kind of looked at one another through their balaclavas and, uh, and they turned around and I'm still preaching at them. And they turned around and they marched up the street and I marched after them. And then you can see them kind of going. And I, I walked behind them, shouting at them and preaching and, and quoting scripture and telling them to repent. It's not too late. You know, the, you know, that they could come into a, a, a kingdom without end and all this. And I can't remember the details, but I remember. And so they, they got to this, this house, Radhus, with a little Irish square garden in the front and the front door there. And I could tell right away, this was their house. And they didn't want me to see the house that they were going into. And all the kids were falling around and they were laughing and they were, because they obviously knew who the men were. And they were, they were like saying, oh, and because I'm a religious guy, 
I knew the rules. They're not allowed to touch me. They're allowed to intimidate me and scare me, but their rules of their organization is you may not touch a person of the book. A true believer, you're not allowed to touch them. It's like bad luck in their eyes. And I knew this. Ha <laughs> ha. So I'm chasing them up the street. You might say, well, Kyle, that, that doesn't. Yeah. And, uh, and so they, they, they kind of went into their door, and I jumped over their fence and followed them all the way up the door. <laughs> Knocked on their door. Come out! Why? Is it just because it was a mad young person, perhaps? I like to think it was because Christ had taken the fear of death away. I'm not afraid to die. I'm not afraid because I know from this life, step into the next, and Christ will be there waiting for me, going, mad man, what were you thinking? Lord, to your glory. Jesus Christ came to free his people from the fear of death, from the fear of bondage in this life. See, human beings are primarily, uh, I just lost the word again, my English is terrible. Uh, Motivated, thank you, Joe. Motivated by the fear of death and everything we do. We work hard in order that we might have food to pay for, or money to pay for food, and we work hard to do things that we, we avoid certain situations because we're afraid, you know, like if anybody afraid of heights? A little bit, a little bit, not much, but a little bit. I'm more afraid of the ground at the bottom of the height. Where you walk to the edge and you look over and it's just a sheer drop. And the, the majority of us human beings are like, yeah, I'm not going near that. I'm not going near that. You ever been to the zoo? We just, Sarah and I were in the zoo 2021 in Berlin and there was feeding time for the lions. And uh, in Berlin Zoo, you can basically reach out and touch the lion. It's that close in their feeding clutch. I'm not joking. It's literally, you can lean across and touch through the bars, the lions. And the lions were roaring because they were hungry. And when they began to roar, you can feel a lion's roar inside you. Like literally, it's so massive you can feel the roar and uh and everybody was up by the bars oh look a lion oh and the lion just turned around and roared at everybody full in the face and you everybody went four steps back <laughs> you know the bars and, and the, the railings weren't enough you need to get back we are motivated for self um, preservation for protection we, we we know that certain things will hurt us and and the whole thing with the fear of the corona, if I can talk about the rona. People are afraid to die. Afraid that they'll lose people. They're, they're, they're motivated by the fear of death. And therefore, the, that fear then makes them do stupid things and give away their rights and everything else. But the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, through his death, has released us from the fear. Therefore, we are, we are not tossed here and there, back and forward by the fear of what might happen or the fear of maybe. Jesus Christ has set us free. We know what happens after death. We know where we go. We are safe and secure. Come what may. One of the great... I don't love the Puritan army of uh, Oliver Cromwell's Puritan army. They were uh, slightly violent and they were not necessarily nice people in Ireland. But one of the testimonies about the Puritan army, uh, Oliver Cromwell's army was they were fearless in battle because they were Puritans and they were believers. And they knew that they either won or they went to glory. The Roman Catholics, they were fighting, or the Episcopalians that they were fighting, they were like, well, maybe. And the the Puritans were like, that's a win-win for me, no matter what. Because they had lost, they understood what Christ had done for them, and they lost the fear of death. They were fearless. That's why Oliver Cromwell and the Puritan army were so, the model army as it's called, the model, the army in which all other armies today are based upon. They were so successful, not just because they were well organized, well armed, but because they were fearless soldiers. Why? Because they were believers who had lost their fear of death. You and I are no longer under that bondage, 
Let's not behave like we're under that bondage. Let's not behave like the people of this world who run after things just in this world. They're motivated by the, the basics. Those things that we need for survival. Christ has delivered us. He has set us free from the small things of this world. Believers, you and I should be motivated by eternity. Not just what can I get in this life. Not what can I do for myself or for my children. But you and I, we live with the insight that one day we will die and we will go to glory. And the things that we do in this life will dictate how we live in that life. And therefore, we are not afraid. Fearless. Remember it says in the book of Daniel, I can't remember which verse it says somewhere in some place, those who know their God, the people who know their God, shall be bold and do fearless things or great things. Let us be that people because it's the reason why Christ died. The world would have us small and weak and frail and are free. And it tells us, it dictates us, it shows us through social media or the TV programs, if you watch TV. And always presents believers as a little bit crazy, creepy, freaky, weird, you know, let me tell you about the Bible. You know, that kind of like weird people or, you know, the, the serial killers are always Bible people, aren't they? Oh, I hate that. They're always kind of just, you know, like... And they would have us freaky and weird and believe that propaganda about ourselves that we are weak and that we are fearful, that we are a little bit strange. That's propaganda. That's a lie. The world in which we know today was built like by people like you and me. The fearless people. The inventors. The writers of law. The fighters for justice. The social system that we have today. The health care that we have today. The laws that we have today were because Christians stood up. The reason why the, the, light have, the light of Christ is so far cast around the globe is in the 1800s, Christians began to take seriously the command, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. And they began to act upon it. And the golden age of the missionary movement was born. More missionaries sent out during that time than ever before ever after more successful missionaries should we say the missionaries sent out today but they're not really on a mission they're not really christian religious they may be effective they are not beloved jesus christ came to destroy the power of death that is he the devil him who has the power of death Destroy his works. To take his control away. We should never be intimidated. Never live in fear. Remember that we belong to him. That is Jesus. We are brethren. We share in his reward. In his righteousness. And that his death broke that yoke. Smashed that cage. Open those dungeon doors and let us go. Let's never go back to that dark dungeon. Let's never long like the, the Israelites did for Egypt's delights. Let us be strong in our mind. Steadfast. We are the ones full of life and they are the ones full of death. We are the ones who beam forth light, happiness, radiance, peace, when all things around us are going to crazy. We are the ones who don't live for the just simple material things of this life, money, big houses, big cars, a uh, career. Do you remember the psalm that we read today, Psalm 49, about the foolishness of those who live simply for material possessions? 
who sacrifice everything for a little bit of recognition, a little bit of furk, a little bit of money. And they finally perish like beasts. They're gone. And we don't remember them. Their life is over. In verse 16, the, the, uh, the writer here, in remembering that he's supposed to be talking about angels or the relationship to Christ and the angels, he then points out, to which of the angels did Christ ever give aid? He doesn't give aid to the angels. It's not to the supernatural forces. He's not interested in those higher. He, Jesus wasn't born an angel. He was born a man. Because he came to save men. Came to redeem sinners. He points out that it was to Abraham. The seed of Abraham. To the Jews. But also we know in Galatians. Not just to the Jews. But all those who were Abraham's children by faith. It's to us. And he's encouraging them. He's supporting them. He's trying to help them to get a grasp on why Christ had to die. And his answer is, he came to die that he might rescue you. That he might release you from ceremonies and sacrifices and symbols. Rites. That you might live in freedom. That you might be able to worship in spirit and in truth. Not through tradition and imaginations. The myths and fables invented by men. That we might have true and real relationship with God. He's demonstrating the reality of this. It's not just theological. I like that about this writer. He's all about the real deal. Therefore, in verse 17, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that is Jesus, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Why did Jesus, why did the Messiah, why did the Son, the prophet, the one who was to come, why did he have to be born a man? Well, it tells us here that he might be made, we, he was made like us in his humanity with all the fears, with all the uh, delicacies of our nature and of our flesh. Have to face all the situations, relationships, circumstances just like us. Whatever circumstance we have experienced in our life, Jesus had experienced. He got hungry. He got thirsty, he got tired, he got happy, he got sad, he had his ambitions, he was disappointed, he was supported, and he was betrayed, he was unjustly treated, he was murdered. Hopefully that will never happen to any of us. But he suffered these things that he might just be like us in order that he might be able to represent us. And it says here, and this is the first time that this, the concept of a high priest is introduced and it's one of the major themes of this book. It's introduced later on in more detail in chapter 5. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. That he might be our religious represent representative before God. That he might be merciful in the sense that he knows exactly what you're going through. He knows exactly the circumstances. I remember when somebody said to me, what can Jesus know? I mean, what can Jesus know? Well, First of all, he was born the illegitimate son of a teenage mum. Born out of wedlock, under discreditable, you know, kind of 
suspicious circumstances. There was no honour in his birth. It was just question marks and suspicion. Who was the father? We don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't Joseph because Joseph wasn't there. So who's the father? They were homeless. Remember they were stuck in Bethlehem. They were homeless at the time. They didn't have anywhere to live. Indeed, they had to camp out in a stall. Not the nice manger that we all see in the Christmas cards or whatever else. It was basically like a walled, ceilingless pen, like a corral. And Jesus was put in a, a manger, not the manger that we see with the, the men, all this music. Oh, it looks so nice and warm and lovely. It would have been stinking of sheep poo and animal poo and... But he, he was a carpenter. No, he was a laborer. A carpenter ha is a skilled profession. A laborer is the one who helps the carpenter. The one who carries the, the logs, carries the tools, does the heavy lifting, dig, digs the ditches. He was poor. All the way through his life. Indeed, when he died, all the only possessions that he had were the things that he was wearing. And he was betrayed, and we all know the stories. He went through these things in order that he might be able to identify with us. He knows exactly how you feel. He knows exactly the circumstance. There's nothing that you haven't gone through that he himself has not gone through. And that understanding, that realization enables him to be empathetic 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 thank you he's able to know how you feel and he's able to be merciful he can identify with you in your circumstance and faithful in that he is the one who is always working for you on your behalf trustworthy he knows exactly how it feels he has that empathy for you. And it makes him perfect for the position that he was to fulfill before God. On our behalf, our great high priest. The one who brought the sacrifice. The one who made the payment. The one who was our representative before the throne of heaven. The one who makes the prayers, the ones who makes the pleas, the one who applies the blood of the sacrifice and sanctifies. That is Jesus. Why did Jesus have to die? Because you and I die. One thing I can say with all certainty about you and all of your lives, one day you will die. I can't tell you that you'll go to America. I can't tell you that you know, you'll go home. Or I can't tell you anything that's going to happen in your life. I am not a prophet. But I can tell you with all, 100% certainty, every person in this room will die. Christ died because we die. He tasted death that we might be freed from the sting of death. He died and sacrificed his own life in order that the life that he lived and the reward that he won through his obedience and his perfect surrender, that he might then share that with us. He died in order that he might indeed be our representative. It says here to make propitiation, a ransom, to pay the cost. That which was required for the sins of the people. Jesus died in order that all of our sin, part of our sin, no. Most of our sin, no. The sins that we have committed, no. Sins that we're in right now, no. Our potential sins in the future, not just them. All of our sin, past, present, and future, all of our sin was laid upon him. And he paid the cost of it all. So that 
As the Bible says, as the east is from the west, so our sins have been removed from us. God looks upon us and sees them no more. They are no longer remembered. They have been blotted out from the Lamb's book. Nothing. What a glorious, wonderful declaration. Pardoned, set free. Not that we're perfect or have been made perfect. We still struggle. We're still dependent. Our fleshy nature still has some residential sin, I could say. Things living inside us that need to be dealt with. All those things are just simply a way of helping us in our sanctification come to greater dependence upon Christ to help us to realize our nece- the, the necessity of depending upon him in faith. In verse 18, For in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is also able to help those who are being tempted. Not necessarily the tempted of being sin, tempted into sin, but tried, tested, it's the idea of a metal bar to test whether a metal, uh, the ingots that they used to, to make in, in biblical times were of pure metal. They would try and bend them. And they knew by the bend or by the warp how much iron or copper or whatever the metal would be. They understood. They would put it through a test. They would try it, tempt it. And we'd, we don't have the same concept But it means the word to try something, to test it, to see if it's going to bend or not. The idea here is that Christ suffered and was tested in order to help those who are also being tested. It's not pie in the sky when you die. It's steak on your plate when you wait. It's real help. Jesus isn't a theological concept. He's a real individual. He's a faithful high priest. He is your high priest to whom you can come to and ask for help. He understands your pain. He understands your life situation. He understands your fear, your doubt. He understands everything that you've ever gone through. He himself has gone through it. No one will ever be able to come to him on the end of the last day and say, Lord, you don't understand. Lord, you never went through what I went through. And the Lord will look at him and go, what? Let me tell you. Let me tell you. And he'll open the book and he'll say, look, read this. See what I went through. Beloved, we have a saviour who is able to save and to keep on saving. That's why when we pray, we pray with confidence. For we know that our pioneer, our captain of our faith, the author and finisher of our faith, he who had made a way where there is no way, that he has called us brethren, family. He has adopted you into his family. He has named you as his own. Not generally, not just kind of like, ah, uh, what's your name again? Daniel, Fred, George, Jimbo, whatever your name is. He knows you. He remembers your name. And he came to die, not just to, as an accident or whatever, whatever, but with a specific, specific, specific purpose. And that specific purpose was to destroy the power of death and he who held it, the devil. That we should be set free from the fear of death. That we might have love, joy, peace, sound mind. That we might be lights in this world. That we might demonstrate the life that he has given us. That we might live by faith. That we might have the confidence of knowing that we have one in heaven who represents us. Our great high priest who lives forevermore to make intercession on our behalf. Who prays for us and is active. Jesus isn't just up in heaven going, come on. Oh, oh, Daniel, oh, oh, I really hope Daniel does this or does that. I really hope he succeeds. No, 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 Christ is there and he is saying to the angels, go and do this. Make this happen in the providence of God. Steer this, move that. Christ is orchestrating 
the events of our life. Whether we understand them or not, he is doing 4D chess. We don't understand the ways of the Lord. They are a mystery to us. But we understand that he is merciful and that he is faithful. He understands and is active on our behalf. We understand that as he suffered and was tested, we know that he can then give us help when we are being tested. Whatever circumstance you're going through in your life, whether temptation, again, don't, we say temptation, and our minds automatically jump to things like sexual sins or, or theft or whatever, you know. That's not what the word means. It means testing. It means trials. It means hardship and difficulties. So much more than just simply foolish tempting the devil coming in. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's more than that. But we have one who is able to provide a way out and deliver us from our temptings, from our trials, from our hardships. So therefore, let us lift up our voices and pray with more confidence. Let us live lives bolder and full on the face of the people around us, unashamed. Oh, how many times have I said we desire a church full of people who are unashamed of the gospel, live their lives for all to see, reckless and full and free. This is the Jesus that we believe in. This is the Jesus of the, the, the exhortation to the Hebrews. Is it your Jesus? Are you still living in the darkness of the fear of death and the propaganda of this world? Are you still living in the, the veiledness? Live free. Live free in your faith. Be bold in the knowledge that he lives to make intercession forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for our salvation. We are so grateful, Lord, that it is not dependent upon us, upon our faithfulness, upon our works, upon our ways. We are so grateful for Jesus who came destined to die in order that he might be crowned with victory and honor and glory. We are so grateful that when you died, Lord, you destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil, that his kingdom crumbled. The Lord, that, that his days are numbered. We know his fate, that he will be plunged into the lake of fire to suffer for all eternity for his wickedness and crimes. Oh, Lord, we are so grateful that you have claimed us, that, Lord, that you have saved us. You called us out of darkness, made us your own, that we are your Beloved brethren, your, your brothers and your sisters, lead indeed Christ, you have called us your children. Lord, that you look after us. We are so grateful. Lord, that you have freed us from the fear of death, from the fear of this life, Lord, that we are bold and reckless almost, careless, Lord, for we know that our Father lives, that Christ our Savior ever lives to make intercession for us that he guards us as a true and real shepherd, that he provides as a, a continual remembrance before the throne, a full pardon for our sins. Oh, Lord, we are so grateful that we know that you are real and living and true and that, Lord, we can turn to you in the midst of any circumstance. You understand, you know, you have gone through the sufferings and the temptings, the trials, the hardships, and that you're able to Help us. You're able to identify with us. You're able to rescue us. You're able to offer us a way out. Lord, we are so grateful. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd help us to put these lessons into our real lives, that we would, we would walk in your ways. We'd walk a little bit bolder. We'd speak a little bit more. Lord, that we would live in such a way that bring you glory in this life as according to your plan and your purpose. Lord, we pray all these things for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' precious name, amen.